Hello and welcome to another episode of Space Audits. Today I'm going to be taking small sections of a presentation that I'm building on laser interferometry and just kind of sectioning out, um, sectioning it out into smaller portions so that it can be digested more easily. So this portion of the interferometry presentation is about Dayton Miller. We're going to cover his contribution to the field of interferometry now. Dayton Miller conducted the most extensive experimentation using laser interferometry during the early to mid 1900s, conducting a total of 5,200,000 measurements. He was able to determine a direct cause and effect relationship with the speed of the ether, the, mo the movement of the sun, and the axial tilt of the cosmic microwave background. The French shift pattern reached their maximum and minimum dimensions in accordance with the equinoxes. This is a direct this is directly relating a translation of motion from the sky to the earth. The subsequent Nicholson Morley experiments in modern times that are trending towards zero for a detection in their French shift pattern only further prove Miller's hypothesis that as you get closer to the surface of the earth, less motion will be translated than at altitude. He also made considerations for the environment of the apparatus, i.e., is it enclosed? Is it in a basement at the bottom of a building? What's it enclosed in? What are those materials made out of? What sort of shielding is used for the apparatus um, and, and for the light beams, that sort of stuff. For this reason, Miller's later work consisted of taking measurements at altitude. This allowed him to make consistent measurements of the fluctuation in ether speed. This is a quote from Miller. A very striking consistency of, the, of their principal characteristics for azimuth and magnitude as though they were related to a common cause. The observed effect is dependent upon sidereal time and is independent of diurnal and seasonal changes of temperature and other terrestrial causes and is a cosmo cosmical phenomenon. Miller, 1933, in a summary of all his laser interferometry work. As, as the universe completes its yearly circuit around, around us on its 23-degree axial tilt, referring to the cosmic microwave background, that motion corresponds to the movement of the sun as it travels along the axis between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer, which produces our seasons. So Dayton Miller's controlled experiments. Um, it should be noted that while Dayton Miller was alive, that his work could not be refuted. Miller undertook extensive controlled experiments to, and procedures to guard against laboratory artifacts and, and objectively determine the sensitivity of his apparatus. So while Miller was doing this, uh, these experiments that were proving, you know, a measurement with the ether in correspondence with the, with the, uh, with the sky, basically, uh, he was criticized heavily. And, you know, they were saying that can't be possible. You must, there must be some air in your work. So a lot of people were attacking and critiquing his work. So while this was going on, Miller would actively take steps to address the criticisms and modify his experiments, um, to to uh, to address the the criticisms basically um so that, that's something that's really cool about miller is every time he was criticized instead of just saying like nah -uh, and like rejecting it or whatever he would uh he would literally do hundreds of thousands of experiments and measurements uh you know directly addressing what was what was previously thought to be wrong so anyway we'll go over some of the steps he took this is just some of the highlights so the, his ability to adjust the mirrors with fine precision, he had really um, precise, finely threaded screws. And just by turning the screws 16 degrees, he could adjust, he could isolate 100 wavelengths of light. Um, he added weights to the apparatus, you know, uh, to when it's spinning, you know, to make sure that it's balancing correctly and it's staying level while, while it's rotating. So he did fluctuations uh, of that to determine how that would affect the French shift patterns. Um, minimizing vibrations, so this is just um, uh, how they how they adjusted the apparatus and how they moved it and got it into position. They had a they had a thin string attached to it, and they would just carefully uh, drag, you know, essentially drag it along. Um, the apparatus itself was suspended in a pool of mercury, so it was frictionless. You know, it would just float on top, and they would spin it very very carefully. Um, they designed special equipment made of aluminum and brass so that it could negate against electromagnetic, I mean, uh, magnetic effects. Um, and again, evaluating the, uh, the way that the mercury interacted with the base of the apparatus. So they tried uh, bases of wood, concrete, 
different metals and basically what they were testing was that was the distribution uh of weight on the mercury and how that would affect the spin and friction and all that um so he tested with different light sources so they were he was testing to see if other light sources would interfere with uh with the french patterns um, so he would put you know direct sunlight artificial light uh, you know of different wavelengths to see how that would interfere with it uh, let's see temperature evaluation so he used artificial heating um to you know heat and cool the apparatus to, to see how uh actual length contraction and uh expansion would affect it um so after he determined that that you know was a thing to affect for he did thermal insulation uh to to further protect to further protect against uh th thermal heating of that nature um, assessing low level thermal effects so he would he would have his assistant you know re take recordings and measurements standing next to the device at varying places to see if like just the b body heat of another person in the room would affect it um, he was very thorough so evaluating environmental environmental temperatures so temperature effects that were from the larger environment were evaluated by constructing special housing to shelter the inter interferometer yeah, so he yeah he he built a uh, house with walls, canvas roof, windows, and all that stuff to shield against the environmental effects. Because basically, what he found was that um, the more in the open you could have the device, but still obviously shielded to protect against the um, factors that will cause variation in the friend shift as much as possible. Uh, but having it at altitude and in conditions in the open, you will get the consistent uh, friend shift readings and. In modern times, what they do is, you know, it's it's all it's in a building. The the apparatus meaning, uh, the apparatus is always in a building. It's in a basement. It's blah blah blah. Like the original Mickelson Morley uh, device was in a basement, and even that still detected a friend shift pattern, albeit um, you know uh, slightly less. It still it still has the potential to to detect it. But when you want, but when you want to get the consistent measurements. Being at altitude and having it um, in the open is, is definitely the way to do it. So observing periodic effects, Miller noted that he never observed any periodic effects expressing themselves according to the civil time coordinates indicating the thermal effects radiating from the specific walls related to the solar heating were not of uh, influence his, his apparatus. So basically, uh, throughout the day, the apparatus wasn't heating in accordance with like the temperature of the, of the day, you know, wasn't affecting anything. It was, it was a, an effect beyond that. It was what he was measuring. So what are you saying with that? So we'll continue on here. So this is, uh, a guy named Robert Shanklin was brought in to, uh, basically character assassinate Miller and his work. And we're going to, we're going to go over a response to Miller's, I mean, I'm sorry, to Shanklin's work. Shanklin's biased. Shanklin, a former student of Miller, later became a proponent of Einstein's relativity theory. He built his career on publications that misrepresented the Michelson-Morley experiments as solid evidence against the existence of ether. The bias raised questions about the objectivity and of Shanklin and his team as reviewers of Miller's work. Misrepresentation of the experimental results. Shanklin falsely claimed that the trials of Michelson Morley that the trials of Michelson Morley experiments, except those carried out by Miller, yielded null results. This misrepresentation ignores the slight positive result obtained by several other interferometer, interferometer experiments, suggesting as a deliberate bias against Miller's findings. Lack of comprehensive evaluation. Shanklin's paper gave it gave the impression of a comprehensive review of Miller's interferometer observations, but was limited in scope. The team focused on searching for random errors or statistical fluctuations in Miller's data and looking for selected data sets that demonstrate temperature artifacts. This limited approach undermines the credibility of their critiques. That's hmm, statistical analysis by a student. The statistical analysis presented in Shanklin's paper was actually conducted by a physicist student named Robert L. Stearns, who received only a footnote credit. The fact that none of the four authors of the paper undertook the analysis was raised questions about the expertise and objectivity of Shanklin's team and their analysis. 
inadequate evaluation of the temperature artifacts, Shanklin's teams raised the possible the possibility of temperature artifacts in Miller's data, but failed to conduct a systematic evaluation. They relied upon they relied on controlled experiments conducted by Miller, which actually demonstrated that the thermal effects were not responsible for the observed periodic displacements. The team's dismissal of Miller's rigorous rigorous temperature control procedures without providing independent experimental evidence is illogical. So yeah, these guys, even from their own paper in Shanklin's uh, paper, it even says that he doesn't have enough of the temperature data to make these claims, but they basically just hand wave, dismiss everything and chalk it up to uh, temperature gradients. And, you know, as if Miller wasn't aware of any of that, which he, you know, obviously was and addressed as many times and even called Einstein out uh, in the, in a paper, but I don't have that included in here. It's already getting a little lengthy, but yeah, there's a long history of, you know, people trying to dunk on Miller and while he was alive, he couldn't do it. So after he died, that's when they, that's when the sharks came in and uh, picked at the bones of his, of his work. Seaton's Miller work on the ether drift, which was conducted with precision and diligence has been disregarded and omitted from the history of science Despite Miller's response to his, critis, to his critics and his consistent demonstration of the ether drift phenomenon, he was viewed as a threat by Einstein and his followers who sought to explain away Miller's work. The Shanklin team in their attempt to discredit Miller selectively analyzed his data and failed to systematically evaluate his most important experiments. While, Shanklin, while the Shanklin conclusion were negative, they, were, they inadvertently confirmed Miller's work of a periodic effect in the interfer interferometer data which was not due to random errors or mechanical effects the shanklin team focused on the temperature artifacts but did not thoroughly analyze miller's most crucial mount wilson data the large issue of the periodic effects of the data and the potential impact of the temperature were not adequately addressed by shanklin's team a team possibly influenced by einstein cherry-picked the data to support their predetermined conclusion that Miller was wrong rather than following the scientific method. Independent studies of Miller's work and his findings or independent studies of Miller's work support his findings of the of an of the existence of an ether like force. So continuing on, this is uh oh slightly out of order here. So that so this is a uh, graph of Miller's data. We'll read off yeah, the figures here. Periodicity of the of global ether drift from Dayton Miller's Mount Wilson ether drift experiment, 1925 to 1926. The top graph above plots the data from four separate months or epochs measured at four or at different times of, of the year organized by sidereal time, showing a definite periodic curve. The heavy line is the mean of all four epochs. The bottom graph above plots the same data organized by civil clock time coordinates. Here is the same data spread out along the graph without apparent pericity. This demonstrates that the detected axis in the pericity of the ether drift is the same for different times of that year, but can only be seen when the data is viewed through a cosmological sidereal coordinate system from Miller, 1928, uh, page 362. These data curves are organized along with azimuth means that were later recomputed with Miller's publication as given in figure 10. And uh, so we'll continue on. Average velocity and azimuth of global ether drift. From Dayton Miller's Mount Wilson ether drift experiments, 1925 to 1926, top graph average variations is observed in observed magnitude of ether drift from all four epochs of measurement, maximum velocities occurs at, at about five hours sidereal time and minimum velocity occurs at about 17 hours sidereal time. While Miller's 1933 paper assumed the Earth was pushing through the ether and moving towards Dorado near the southern pole of, of the plane of the ecliptic, the movement and direction of the ether drift past the interferometer was exactly opposite to this toward Dr Draco near the North Pole in the plane of the ecliptic, 17 hours right ascension, declination of plus 68 degrees. It is important from the standpoint of his working th theory to clarify the concepts of the net motion of the Earth versus the direction of the ether drift. However, if the ether itself is in motion, acting as a cosmic 
prime mover, the direction of the ether drift and the net motion of the earth would be identical through a, although at different velocities. Bottom graph, average variation in observed azimuth readings according to sidereal time. This graph uses the same average and data curve fig from figure 11, top graph published by Miller, 1928, page 330, or 363, but at the time was given a different baseline average. The, the same graph is present here for the first time using Miller's revised seasonal averages as published in 1933, page 235, which helped define the axis of ether drift. Amazingly, the independent averages of, of the four epochs provided by Miller, February equals minus 10 degrees west of north, April equals plus 40 degrees east, August equals plus 10 degrees east, and September equals plus 55 degrees east, yielded together a mean displacement of 23.75 degrees east from north, figure Figure 13. This is close to the Earth's axial tilt of 23.5 degrees and can hardly be a coincidence. More, uh, more discussion in Demio uh, 2002. So, quick recap here. Let's go to previous. So, uh, Dayton Miller. So, this is what he modeled out uh, based on those measurements. So, basically, he, you know, thought that he was measuring the axial tilt of the Earth and all that. So a measurement or a model constructed by Miller displaying the axial, the axis of ether drift for the four seasons of epoch of the earth moving around the sun, the axis of drift. And this model appears to be roughly perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic. So this is what uh, Miller, Miller modeled out from his measurements. Those slides backwards. So anyway, so uh, I'm going to let this, I'm going to play this out. This is what Miller measured essentially on a flat plane with the sun doing all of the same stuff that he measured in the ether translating the motion of the sky down to the earth so we'll, i'll let this play us out nice i messed up the full screen gg 